so the first first lecture on dating methods is just the introduction and and the basic point is no dates, no race. If you can't date it, you don't know how fast things are going. And we really need race to understand processes and also hazards. So uh, I'm going to go over the Quaternary time scales and correlations. Just remember what we're trying to date, which is mostly the Quaternary time scale or even Holocene or even just centuries, just hundreds of years. Overview of the main method, and then the main point to make is that is that there are two classifications in general. There's relative dating, which means just one surface is older than the other, and then there's absolute or numerical dating. So a lot of what I'll show comes from the the Burbank and Anderson textbook. So here's just to remind us the chronostratigraphy of the quaternary, and you know there are some people who are, this is their whole research is working on geologic time scales. So this is a really nice poster that I found online, and I'll, I'll zoom in for just in a moment to each half, but basically this is time on this axis, and then all these different measures and um, indicators of changing history. And so here just shows, for example, the, you know, the system, Time names so quaternary, and then Pleistocene, Holocene, and then we come into other things like the magnetic reversal time scale. And I won't talk about magnetostratigraphy or paleomagnetism, but that's another tool that is used more for longer time scale, like into the sort of middle uh, Pleistocene, if you have enough, a few. Re re uh, reversals and then the big reversal starting when you get into earlier in the quaternary or Pleistocene. So then we've already talked about marine isotope stages. So this is basically a measure of, of the sea level and, and the balance between ocean volume and ice volume. And this is a big uh, thing we would use for correlation. So then you can continue on. There's a, a lot of effort in the polar regions, especially Antarctica drilling really get these may these uh, sort of critical long records and then just sliding over on this poster you see Chinese lust sequence so the lust is the, the silt that's moving by the wind probably mostly derived by uh, from retreating glaciers so if you have glaciers that are melting they all the fine grain material that is produced when the glaciers are pushing the rocks and grinding the rocks past each other, all that silt is blown, and then it moves around, and especially in in uh, sort of north, central, and northeast China, there's these famous packages of lust, which uh, accumulate with some frequency that's probably climate controlled. So then you can keep going, like Baikal has a big record of changing history, kind of silica content, maybe saying how much uh, basically air temperature and algae population. And then the final thing here is the names of the glaciation. So sometimes when you talk uh, about these time scales, someone like let's say me coming from North America will say, oh, that's a Wisconsinian or a Sangamonian or an Illinoisan stage. And those are just uh, kind of regional names for glacial advances or retreats. And in North America, they have one set of names. In Russia, they have another set. British, another set. And North Europe, and even New Zealand. So that's one of the purposes of a chart like this, is just correlation. So always keeping in mind the bigger picture of ge geochronology and climate change. So then there's this book that is a nice book. It's now from 2000, so it's 13 years old, but it's a very complete book. There are other ones uh, on quaternary geochronology and has this big poster in the back that says methods for dating quaternary surface hole materials. And so here I just zoom in and it shows different methods. So these are, basically it shows the kind of method, the name of the method, 
how well developed it is, and the range of applicability in time, and a little bit of the error. So, so this is a nice chart because of everything in here. So dark means it's a, a pretty uh, accurate or precise method, and, and then the lighter these things are, then the, not, the worse it is. So you see some of these sidereal or, or methods that can almost measure on an annual time scale changes. So the obvious one is dendrochronology with tree rings. And then VARVs are uh, in annual layering and sedimentary sequences like in lakes or sometimes in marine in ocean settings. And the sclerochronology I think is um, cave records. So then the isotopic methods are the ones that we're many of us are familiar with, and I'll talk about the uh, cosmogenic and the C14 methods. And so you get a sense, you know, C14 is pretty good and pretty precise and goes to about, you know, 50,000 years. And then the different cosmogenic methods are good to, you know, they don't go too young, but they can go, you know, 10,000 to a million years. And then argon, argon, for example, these, this is a more higher temperature method. So usually, uh, requires and, and also requires enough decay that you can tell the difference between the parent and daughter products that it doesn't work that well less than about 10,000 years and so on. I'll also talk about luminescence. And so the luminescence can work. They're experimenting at very young ages and it can go as far as 100,000 to 300,000 years. So we can scroll down on this same chart. And then there are other methods. I'll mention briefly this lichenometry as some of these more, what they say, the relative methods starting about in here. And so there's all kinds of, of approaches for just comparison. So soil profile, we've already mentioned that the surface is there at Longer, it will have developed more soil weathering. I'll mention this briefly. Scarp morphology, a young scarp is deeper than an old one. And then paleomagnetism, which is uh, also quite powerful. Tephra, which could work here because you have a lot of volcanoes. So in some settings, you might be able to date layers by identifying mm -hmm. tephras done a lot in, in Japan, and then paleontology. So, so that's just the overview of all kind of many dating methods. So secular variation is, uh, in, you know, there's reversals which are very sharp, you know, at the, yeah, just, but actually the Earth's uh, no magnetic north pole kind of meanders around. It's not constantly in the same position. So what that means is if you measure really accurately the vector of magnetization in a rock, you can see that it points over time in slightly different directions. And so that's a sort of, it's not the full 180 rotation, but just the, the annual, they call it sometimes the apparent polar wander. So it's wandering around. If you can calibrate it, you can use it. It can work in sediments uh, reasonably well. The, the main thing is you need to have a situation where there's enough magnetite or some iron-bearing minerals, and the sedimentation is kind of gentle enough that as the, the minerals are, are settling, they can kind of be oriented with the current magnetic field. Or... Immediately after it's sedimented, if you start to have a iron-rich cement, then as it's precipitating, you know, the, the iron-rich minerals will be aligned in the magnetic field. And so as long as you can capture that magnetic field at the time of sedimentation or soon after, then as you accumulate, you can see the change. So it works best with uh, reversal is the magnetostratigraphy main application. It's hard to do the secular variation with sediments, but it can be done. The 
other thing that is used a lot is then basalt. Well, basalts are full of iron-rich minerals, and as they're cooling, the minerals become aligned with the magnetic field. And so I know that I learned recently that you can correlate some lava flow by secular variation. So if this lava flow comes out and then 10,000 years later this lava flow comes out, there may not be a reversal between them, but this lava flow has a vector like this, and this one over here is slightly different. And so you can separate the, mag the lava flows by their uh, paleomagnetic vectors and then use that to correlate. Okay, so, so I'll just uh, mention a few relative dating methods just to kind of give a sense of what do we mean by relative dating. So this is just a table from Burbank and Anderson. And so I'll show a few of these. Actually, I, I like anometries, which is not listed here. The so first thing is class seismic velocity. So this is a simple example. If you have a, a, a class, like a boulder, sitting on the surface, the idea is that the older it gets, the lower the velocity, seismic velocity in the rock, so the more weathered it is. And so this is trying to show this example where it was distant from modern dunes, but really increasing age going this direction for these series of, of class in this environment. And so what they would do is you, you have a timer and an accelerometer, and so you hit the rock, and that triggers so the time, and then you know how far for the seismic wave to get through the rock. So, so you know, it's a, the boulder is, uh, you know, some size here, like one meter, and if the class seismic wave speed is a kilometer per second, it takes a millisecond to get across the rock, right? But you can, you can measure that time pretty well, and you know the distance L, so you can get the velocity. So they go and just bam, 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 and start to see, oh yeah, so these are older, older class because they're slower. Of course, it requires that it's the same material type. So this is just a, maybe the, a, one of the simpler examples of relative dating. So here's another example of a weathering rind. So what this means is, is you have a rock like this, it's an old rock, it's been sitting on the surface, and so the rind just means, like, if you have an orange, you know, and you peel the orange, so the rind is the outer part, and so over time, the rind gets thicker, because the weathering penetrates the rock, and so what they showed in this uh, project was that the thickness of this rind increased with time, and this was on some moraines, so, so these are, are some different moraines, and this makes a key point that you have to do what we call calibration. So you have to, with the relative method, you have to know the age of some things independently. And then you measure the feature, like the rind thickness. So you calibrate. And then you go to an, a place that's unknown age. And then you measure something like the rind thickness, which is fairly easy. And then you could get the age. But it requires that the... Your assumption, the conditions of formation are the same from place to place, right? And so something like rind thickness would be a climatically controlled and also rock type controlled. So it's, you know, these relative methods kind of work well when you're close by and, and uh, conditions are too different. So another kind of dating, uh, relative dating method is carbonate coating. It's similar to the rind thickness, but instead of the weathering going into the rock, it's a coating or accumulation of, carb of ca calcium carbonate on the outside of the rock. So this is especially uh, true in, in more semi-arid environments. So we see precipitation come to a site. It brings a certain amount of dissolved calcium and CO2, but then because of so warm and dry, the water evaporates. But when it evaporates, it leaves the CaCO3 as a, a crystal. So it precipitates out. So the longer the time, the more accumulation of calcium carbonate. So, so you can measure the thickness of these rinds, and usually they're 
on boulders. Here's an outcrop from where, where near where we live, and you see mostly this fluvial gra uh, gravel, and between all the fluvial gravels are it's almost 100% carbonate, so it's impregnated with carbonate, and it's a very old 400,000 years of time it's been sitting there at the surface accumulating carbonate. So this would be old, it's full of carbonate. Something like this might be a little bit younger because it's not completely covering the rocks with carbonate. So there's different ways to uh, make these measurements, but here's one where the, the work was done to another calibration study where we just measured carbonate thickness of the coating uh, versus time. And you see that over time, the, the thickness went from almost nothing to about 1.5 millimeters, and it was all, uh, out to about 20,000 years in this place. So pretty good uh, if conditions are the same, like in the same valley, maybe. And here's one that one of my students did uh, in a paper we worked on a normal fault. And there, he did a slightly different thing. He looked at the kind of the average, he did averaging of averages. So he would go, he would dig a hole and into the conglomerate, and then he would measure the rind thickness of, um, I forget how many, at least 10 clasps at each level. So, you know, five centimeters, 15, and so on. And then he would take the average rind thickness for that level and then go to the next one. And then he would go on down, and so you could see this increase in rind thickness. So this is in the soil, the carbonate accumulation level. It's called the B horizon. And uh, so we see a lot of carbonate at that level, 20 to 40 centimeters. And then he looked at the average of the average. So he had this 0.87 millimeter average thickness in kind of maximum average thickness. And, 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 um, or maximum, yeah, maximum average thickness. So then that goes into this chart where there was independent ages actually from cosmogenic dating. And so his study showed that as, as the surfaces got older, the rind thickness increased. But it wasn't linear. It seemed like they kind of got a little bit saturated. So in other words, as they got older, the rate of accumulation of the CaCl3 wasn't as fast. Because in a way, the more carbonate you have in the soil, like this one, it's plugging up the soil. It can't get more in, and ultimately it becomes completely uh, plugged and low permeability. So it stops accumulating carbonate. So he has a special kind of a, a lens that has a, a little grid on it. It's like a ruler inside the lens. I forgot what it's called. Like a, I don't know, a special device. So if you want to measure you know, on the rock, you can get the scale. So yeah, he would, he would take the class, like these, and he would break it and open. And then he could look at the class and on the edge, he could see that thickness. And measure it, throw it away, get another one. Open, measure, okay, keep going. And so then he got these numbers here for each level. And he averaged them, and then he takes the average of the average in this maximum zone to, to get the number that he's going to use for comparison across the, the way. So this is an example of the, it's a little bit arbitrary, you know, there's different ways to make these measurements, and people can do them slightly differently one study to the next. And that means that it, it still works if you do it the same way, one study to the next, but if you do it slightly differently, then you have to check that you're getting the same answer. So here's one. This one is more usually in higher uh, in sort of alpine environments, colder ones, but uh, maybe just gives a general idea of, of another method. And it's called lichenometry. So these lichens are these strange living things, right? They're half algae and half fungi. They live on rocks. And so the fungi provides the water and the minerals, and the algae uses the water and minerals to, to, and the sun to make, you know, sugar.
sugars and uh, and then the fungi eat those sugars so they kind of share, right? It's symbiosis. And so you can see the fungi, different species, but the main way you do it is you just measure the size of the fungus and it or the lichen and it grows over time. So here's an example. So they do maximum lichen diameter versus age. And you see it's it's you know, this is a much finer time scale, so just two hundred years, but these lichens grew from, you know, twenty millimeters to a hundred over uh, 200 years so and and what they do is maybe look at uh, rock fall so you have some rock avalanche falls down from the mountain so all the rocks are fresh surfaces at one moment and then at that moment then the lichen start to grow and so if it's a young deposit you'll just have little small communities but then over time the communities grow and grow and grow and grow so this is an approach that's commonly used for uh, landslides, rock avalanches, especially. You know, you may say, well, it doesn't apply to the questions I have, but you may also think of the principle, you know, so what, is there something else that I can use that is changing in a, a way that I can calibrate? And then later on, you just go and you start looking, you say, oh, okay, it's a 60 millimeter diameter lichen. It's probably, un so that's the end of the relative dating. Oh, moraine number. So what what the question was, what they were doing with this, so this is Swedish Lapland, so it's high latitudes in northern Europe. And what they would they would do is is find the moraine, so some kind of pile of rocks that's pushed by a glacier across a wide region. And then they would do the they calibrated the lichenometry and then they started measuring the lichens on different deposits, rock deposits, or moraine deposits. And then they just accounted how many are of different ages. And and so what they could show is it looked like these different peaks are different glacial advances in the last few hundred years. So they're not a full glacial advance, but just a small global cooling or some kind of regional cooling. The glacier goes forward, pushes the material, then it melts. And another time, and so this is basically a indicator of kind of the manifestation of climate variation on the glaciers in the region. So now I'll move to absolute dating methods, and I'll just show a couple, but I've already reviewed this. This is a, a table, kind of like the big one I showed at the beginning, uh, just to compare. Talk a little bit about what materials are needed for different methods and some references. But that's the end of this lecture, which is just the introduction.